This is Ham College, Episode 2 for February 28, 2015. This episode of Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Got cabin fever? Well, get out or hunker down with ICOM. to another episode of Ham College. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And we're, I was looking for a third person to say their name there. You yeah, know, it was just kind of have it, wasn't it? Yeah, it seems kind of weird. <laughs> we'll get Peter on here with us one day. You know, he's from Australia, so the, the question and answers we're covering here are not really yeah, going to... not going to be totally applicable. Nah, be so similar. Not, yeah. Yeah, yeah it would be good to have him sit in. Maybe yeah. discuss some of the differences sometime. Yeah, it, it probably would be, because so much of it is going to be the same. And maybe we can get Mike in from Canada and talk about, yeah, you know, some actually, of the ones. Yeah, actually, I'm sure we've got some other viewers from around the world. Maybe we, well, we that, do. Would, that would be kind of cool to compare some yeah, of the things. we got the guy down in Colombia and people in England. And oh, yeah, all, all yeah all lots of them. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of them would be glad to get on with us. And a, us a few of them right now may be in the chat room whenever we do a show and we're streaming it live we run a chat room at the same time amateurlogic.tv slash chat you can go there and uh, hang out with the other people in the chat room there's a number of them in there right now what was in the last show what did we talk about last time well for the history lesson and the project we went over spark gap transmitters here's a typical spark gap right here this is one that we showed of course not only that we actually built our own spark gap and you can see that little spark right there can't you yeah well, that was a lot of fun yeah it was really a buzzer but it made a spark so you could hear it on the radio well you could <laughs> feel the heat coming off of it well you could and you, you know <laughs> if we'd used a bigger battery you probably could have welded with it yeah <laughs> or it would have sparked one time and stuck right there uh, I but think the battery was big enough to suit me though yeah yeah 12 <laughs> volts at seven ampere hours yeah. yeah that's probably all that was safe we also talked a little bit about Elmer's and how important they are to the amateur radio hobby. You know, most anyone who's been in for any length of time had somebody along the way that kind of helped them out and mentored them and, you know, helped them uh, find their way through the hobby, showed them the ropes, maybe helped them uh, tune their antennas or build an antenna, one thing or another. And that's what an Elmer is. And we talked all about where the, the term came from. But we need more of those. Yeah, El Elmering is a critical part of the hobby. It, it is. It this really helps to propagate it, you know, keep people's interest, uh, help people explore things that they, they wouldn't think to do on their own or don't mm -hmm. have the knowledge to do on their own. Yeah. And, and you basically feed off of one another. It's a lot of satisfaction helping someone also. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, our, our good friend Gordon West, WB6NOA, has the Ham Radio Instructors Academy. I believe that's the name of it. Yeah. And, you know, he teaches teachers, or basically Elmer's. And uh, you can go to gordonwestradioschool.com, and he'll have more information there on that. But I guess the first segment in the show tonight, what's it going to be, Tommy? The history of receivers, early radio receivers. Since I don't know what you're going to do, I guess you, you should do it. Well, why don't I just do it? There you go. There we go. Or maybe I'll just put these on so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> That's an even better idea. Yeah, like we said, we're going to talk about early radio receivers. In the early days of radio, receivers were referred to as detectors for the most part. I guess they yep. had no concept of receiver at the time. But in 1888, Heinrich Hertz, I keep wanting to say that with the German accent, but uh, I don't do a good accent. Anyway, we discussed him last month. He d demonstrated one of the first types of receivers of early radio waves that were transmitted by James Clerk Maxwell. Remember him from Ham College last I month? I sure do, yeah. 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 
Mr. Maxwell used a spark gap transmitter and a metal ring with a gap in it. The ring would spark when it received the radio waves from the spark gap transmitter. It didn't look just like this one we're showing right here. <laughs> and the spark probably wasn't quite as brilliant and hot either, but yeah. still. Another form of radio receivers was the coherer. It was basically a glass tube contained metal filings between two electrodes. When the small electrical charge from the radio waves were picked up by the antenna were applied to the electrodes, the metal particles would cling together or cohere, cause the device to become conductive. Or this receiver was first demonstrated in 1894. So yeah, before the turn of the century. Yeah. Around that period, there were a lot of improvements to both radio receiving and transmitting gear. A Russian engineer, Alexander Stepanov Popov, Stip well, how come these guys don't have simple names like Bob <laughs> Jones or something? He but. invented the pop-off valve. <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually developed a lightning strike detector based on the coherer receiver. Marconi also used a coherer base design in the first demonstrations of a practical radio wave based wireless telegraphy system. John Ambrose Fleming developed an early thermionic valve to help detect radio waves based upon a discovery by Thomas Edison. You may have heard of it called a light bulb. Uh, yeah. Anyway, this was called the Edison effect, which essentially was a modified early light bulb. Fleming called it an oscillation valve because it functions similar to a one-way water valve. In the United States, we call these tubes nowadays. A cat's whisker detector, often called a crystal receiver, was another kind of receiver developed. These typically used a Galena crystal with a wire spring contact. By moving the wire to different points on the crystal, an optimal point of rectifying the signal was achieved. I actually had a radio one time that had a cat whisker uh, detector on it, just like the one we're looking at there. I didn't have one of those, but I did build a crystal radio set when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I, I built at least three or four different ones and never got any of them to work. Really? I live too far out in the country from from a radio station, and I guess that was just Oh yeah, you know. We lived in town. I liked it. I I listened to mine a lot. It was really cool because you didn't have to have a battery to power yeah. the thing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I've got one already built. What if we look at that? That'll work. All right. Well, first let's get a message from ICOM, and then we'll get things set up here and come back and play a little bit with the Crystal Radio set. Okay. From new models to classic radios, there's something for everyone this season. So get out or hunker down with ICOM. Celebrate ICOM's 50th year with the IC7850. Only 150 units are available, and each radio features 1.2 kilohertz optimized roofing filter, a new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and distinct gold accents on the front panel and commemorative label. For contesters just starting out this year, ICOM's IC7600. You get advanced DSP technology and IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Got cabin fever and need to get away? Get mobile with ICOM's IC2730A and ID5100A. The analog 2730A mobile and digital 5100A with built-in GPS. Both feature optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and the large backlit screen. For entry-level D-Star operation, take the ID888H on the road. Features include a good menu structure and VHF-UHF dual-band functionality, one band at a time. Time. To hunker down or get out, the ID51A Plus is a perfect radio to enjoy global communications. This dual bander has the free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, enhanced DV functionality, and additional D-plus reflector link commands. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on ICOM's base stations, mobiles, and portables. All right, as promised, here's a crystal radio right here. This one is a Vectronix kit from Vectronics.com. That's an MFJ company. Yeah. Very simple to put together. The kit came with everything, including the block of wood, uh, a little bit of wire, a few components. It takes no battery. And the schematic, well, it looks like this. You can see there's an antenna on there. Mm -hmm. Well, where's our antenna on this one, Tom? Oh, that's going to be our wire we've got right here. That coil of wire. Yeah, yeah. it should be stretched out outside. Yep. So connected to the <coughs> antenna, we've got an inductor that's connected to ground. Where is the inductor, Tommy? It's going to be this big old coil right here. Yeah, I wound that on a piece of PVC and glued it on there with super glue to hold it steady. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, my fingers were on there for a day or two. <laughs> couldn't let well. go of it. Couldn't quite let go of it, but uh, 
you know, it, it wound up pretty good. They tell you how many turns to put on there and everything, oh, yeah? depending on what frequency you want to receive, because it's a tuned circuit. And the other part of that tuned circuit is the capacitor. And where is the capacitor? Right here. And you can just tune that to the frequency. And, and those two together, that inductor and capacitor form a tuned circuit. And that's how you tune the radio to the frequency that you want. Cool. So uh, you know that's that's all there is uh, basically to tune it. Uh, next to that, we've got a detector diode, and you know we just looked at that cat whisker a moment ago. That was a detector during World War II in the trenches. Uh, a lot of the GIs used what they call foxhole radios, and they were made from materials they could find. And for a detector, they would use a blued razor blade and a piece of carbon. Oh, that's cool. And that would act just like that cat yeah, whisker. I've heard of those before. This one right here is using something different, though, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, it's using this diode right here. Yep, and that's a germanium diode, small signal diode. That's what actually takes the signal and converts it to audio that we can hear. Cool. And there's a couple of other components on there, and that is a resistor to ground, and that's a fairly high value of resistor. You need that to kind of get the current to flow. And the last thing on the right-hand side there is a set of headphones and well we don't really have headphones but we have this nice high impedance ear plug is what we used to call them i was going to call it an earbud but yeah that's a that's a big one i haven't seen one quite like that in a while yeah it's high impedance you know most of them you find around would be eight ohms or so you know this one's a high impedance if you put an eight ohm one across there you wouldn't really hear anything you just load the circuit down too much okay. so what we're going to do here is demonstrate how this would work. This one's already been built, but you can see just how simple it is. And if you're interested in kits in the $20 neighborhood, it's not very expensive. Oh, it's not bad. Tell me why you don't have to have a battery for this to work. Well, that's a good question. Okay, and and so the reason maybe you is, shouldn't tell me. Then. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, it's hoped that you've got enough of the RF energy being introduced into your antenna here that that detector, it's a small signal detector, can actually rectify it and turn it into audio. So you're, the power in this radio is actually the RF power right. out of the air. So you gotta have a, a fairly good signal for it yeah. to work. Now, we're at a little disadvantage. The studio here is a metal building and their radio signals do not get inside of here. Evan, your cell phone won't work in here. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Right. So, uh, you know, that's going to kind of make it tough for us to pick up a radio signal with it. Also, you need a, a ground connected to it. You'll notice that there were grounds across all the components there at the bottom. Well, back here uh, at the set, there is no ground connection, yeah. but I think we can work around that. We'll just stretch out a piece of wire here and pretend that's ground. Okay. Here, I'll hook it up to the ground. Yeah. My iPad. For a radio station, you know, we don't really have one of those in here either, well, except for our amateur stations. But I do happen to have an old general radio audio oscillator. Okay. Which you'd say, well, that's not RF, and that's true. But this thing actually will go up to 2 megahertz. Oh. And that'll cover the AM radio band. Oh, that's cool. And you can inject external audio into it and actually use it like a little transmitter. Now... It's more of a signal injector. It's a very tiny level, so it's not like you could put it on an antenna and you're broadcasting. Oh, we won't really need very much yeah. since we're right here beside it. Yeah, it's made to be injected directly into a circuit when, you, mm -hmm. when you're testing. But what we can do here is just use a couple of clip leads here as an antenna connected to our oscillator or our radio transmitter. We'll just kind of throw it over our antenna lead there oh, just so it gets a little coupling. They're not physically connected, they're, they're just close to each other. And now I'm going to try to do this and see if I we can. I can hear it. It's pretty strong. There you go, I can see it on the video meter. Yeah, and you can tell when you get right on frequency there, you know, that it it's picked up quite a bit. Uh, one thing you will notice, even off frequency, you pick it up a little bit. 
So what's going to happen with the crystal radio of this type? If you've got several strong stations in the area, you're likely going to hear a little bit all of them at once. <laughs> it's pretty broadbanded. Huh? Yeah. Some of the better ones add more tuned circuits in there so that, um, you, you know, you can kind of filter that out and narrow it down to just the station you want to pick up better. Yeah. It sounds like you're hearing aid squealing. It is. Let's see. If we move the antennas away a little bit further. Oh, wow. It's a little more sensitive then. You've got to be right on it or you don't get anything. Okay. That's pretty strong lane right there on the antenna. It's probably overloading the circuit, so. Yeah, yeah. So there you go, the crystal radio. Well, that's pretty cool. Prove to me it works. Yeah, I hear it. This little kit is a Vectronics VEC 121K, in case you're interested in getting one for yourself. Yeah, for around 20 bucks. That's a fun little project. Yeah, and I actually took this one here and pulled the diode out, and I blued my own razor blade, because you can't buy blued razor blades anymore. By heating it? by heating it really hot with a torch. And I mounted it down there and I got a little pencil and I sharpened it up to a real sharp point and I used it and made a detector to go in place of that diode. And it worked? It worked. Cool. Yeah, so, uh, y you know, what? it sounds like BS, but <laughs> you know, it really worked. <laughs> well, maybe we have to experiment with that sometime in the future, maybe. I think so. Well, we need to clean off the table here and get ready for the next thing, so Right now, let's have one more message from another sponsor of Ham College. On the 15th of each month, ICOM is proud to sponsor AmateurLogic.tv with host George Thomas, Tommy Martin, and Peter Barrett. This looks a little crude, but roughly here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. Actually turn that into a scanner capable of tuning across a wide range of frequencies. Whoa, okay. What is this called? We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas via the switching matrix. Down in Melbourne, apparently they, they tune up their radios <laughs> different than we do, Tommy. Oh yeah? Now the FM 900 is tough. Seriously tough. <coughs> we finally arrived. Man, we are in Ham Nirvana. Again. Boy, what, what a great time. And, and as happened last year, we still haven't got all the way through the flea market yet. No, we've been hit about a fourth of it, but we're going to have to strike a trot. Well, the moment of truth has arrived. I've attached a BNC connector to the antenna terminals here. I've got plus 12 volt in ground uh, power coming in here. It's going to my uh, power supply. Uh, that I'm supplying it with 13.8 volts. And I personally am so thrilled that... George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl, or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier, and oh, I lost power in the shack, and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. It always gets me there at the end. <laughs> yeah. one, one day, I'm going to just freak you out. I'm going to write a theme song. I'm just going to break out singing. <laughs> okay. Maybe Probably will freak everybody else out, too, not just you. Maybe we'll get right to it. There you go. He's <laughs> got the best singing voice. Come on, pal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's time to get into uh, a little bit of the question and answer study portion of the program now. Y you know, last week, we showed you where you could download those questions. Yep. Those questions were made up from a source from somewhere, and that was FCC Rules and Regulations, Part 97. You can download that from the ARRL, ARRL.org, slash part-97-amateur-radio, dash dash amateur dash radio. and in there is the actual rules and regulations that the question pools were made up from, uh, along with a lot of other information that really you'll need and you know as an amateur you're supposed to have a copy of part 97 yeah absolutely so uh used to back in the old days you had to go buy that book you know 
or or get it from somewhere. Uh, I know a couple of guys who sold it as a computer program that you could use. Anybody I know? Uh, I think, yeah, I think both of them you know. Bro, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was many years ago. That was actually a shareware thing. It was. Yeah. It was. But we but, we did that for a few years. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. We had a lot of people download it yeah. back in the old bulletin board days. We we made enough out of that to pay for the rules that we had to buy to, yeah. to put in there. But yeah. uh, anyway, hey, at least we broke it even on it. Um, but today, you know, you can just download them off the Internet. So that's the easiest way to get it. And I'm not sure if you need a printed copy in your shack if you have a computer on the Internet where you can get to it. Yeah, but, but as long as you have, probably as long as you have it handy, yeah. I think that's probably good. Yeah. Oh, we talked about the question pool last week, and we'll just show that again, ARRL.org slash question dash pools. And that's where you'll find the actual questions and all the multiple choice answers that go with them that could possibly be on your technician exam. We're covering technicians exams at this point. And that's what we're going to go over today. We've got another group of questions here out of that pool to help you get prepared for the amateur radio license exam or just as a review for you who are already hams. You know, it's kind of fun to go over some of this stuff. Tommy and I have yeah. kind of uh, learned and refreshed a few things as we've gone through this. So. Um, Kind of interesting. And, and as you see, when we go through it, there's some of them we may not have refreshed. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you could be on to something there. <laughs> so first question is, which of the following is a valid U.S. amateur radio station call sign? A, KMA3505. B is going to be W3ABC. C is KDKA. And D is 11Q1176. I hope that's what that says. That is what that says. Okay, we're so. I have to get a bigger TV. Yeah, I'm going to have to clean my glasses or something, <clears> I think. <throat> anyway. Okay, so. Which do you think, Tommy? Which is a valid one? Well, I, I can tell you right now, just from being a ham for the last 20 some odd years, is it, the answer is going to be B. W3ABC. <laughs> and you know, that's. Um, well, there's some, some reasoning behind that. The United States is divided into to separate groups there. And you can see down here in the south with Texas in the center of it, that's zone five. That's where Tommy and I are. Over to the east or southeast, there's zone four. Covers um, a good many states in the southeast there. California over has got their own zone. They're zone six. Up in the northwest, we've got zone seven. In the Midwest there, Zone 0 and Zone 9 over there by the Great Lakes as well as 8. And then 3, 2, and 1 up in the Northeast. All those zones, when you get a license from the FCC, they're going to issue you your first call sign. It's going to have a number in it depending on which of those zones you list as your address. Right. And for a technician, the first letter is going to be either, or this is for any amateur in the U.S., the first letter is going to be either an A, K, N, or W. Right. All right, and those aren't exclusive, like uh, um, a technician could have an A, you know, as his first letter. Mm -hmm. Most of them, though, at this point, seems like they're issuing K call signs, aren't they? Uh, most of the newer ones that I've seen are K. Yeah. When we were licensed as technicians, they were still on ends. Right. And they finally ran out of ends, so they moved to, I think, KD, maybe. Maybe there were some KB. KCs. KB? Yep. Uh, Stan had a KB. That's right. Um, but there's two different call sign formats you can get as a technician. You can get what's called a one by three, and that's going to be one letter followed by one number. And then three more letters. Three more letters, yeah. Or just like you, mine. You can get a two by three, and what would that be? Well, just pretty much what you said: two letters, one number, and three letters on the end. Mm -hmm. Which is what the most of the ones I've seen lately are: K K D five something something something. Yeah. So forth. So that that's currently what's being issued, but there's At least in our area. Yeah. We're going to talk here in, in a second about vanity call signs. If you don't like the call sign you got, you can apply with the FCC, and for a fee, 
a small fee. <laughs> Pretty much it, a small fee to get you anything yeah. these days. Yeah, well, except one that hadn't already been given to somebody else. But you can change your call signs. Then you can choose a one by three or a two by three, and you can start it with an A, K, N, or W, as long as no one else has that call sign. But that's going to be in a question coming up here in you, just a little bit. And yours is a vanity call sign. Mine is a vanity call sign. I was originally an N5, just like you are. Mm -hmm. And I was an N5 for years and years. And I don't know, one day I was looking around and I did a search and I found that W5JDX was available. And I used to work for WJDX. And it was the oldest station in the state, you know, a heritage station. And uh, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to have that for my call sign. So I applied to the vanity system and, and got the call sign. How much did that cost you? I can't remember exactly in the neighborhood of $20. That's like not that. too bad. Not too bad. And my, I've still got the original one I had when I was first licensed. Yeah. I actually kind of liked it, so I'm just going to. Yeah, you it. had a good one. Mine, I don't. I really didn't like it that much. <laughs> and I won't go into why, but I just didn't like it that much. But I kept it a long time anyway. So once again, there's your call sign areas there, and you see, like here in in Mississippi, Tommy and I fall into a five. Well, when I got my vanity call sign. I could have chose any number that's on there. I wouldn't necessarily have to have a five. Yeah, you can you can buy from whatever area. Yeah. And the other thing to say is, if you if you're in our area and you were issued a five, and you relocate to uh, Illinois or whatever where the nines are, you mm -hmm. don't have to change that. You can keep yours. You can, you can keep it. Yeah. So used to, if a guy gave his call sign, it's got a number in it, and you could tell by that number what part of the United States he lived in. Not so much so today. Yeah, free for all now. Well, uh, sort of. <laughs> so, I mean, it's ba the majority of licenses do fall within their, yeah. you know, the call area there, yeah, but, but you can't some of them it, don't. So. Yeah. Well, let's go on to the next question here. Which of the following is a vanity call sign which a technician class amateur operator might select if available? You know, I bet you can get this one, Tommy, because we just talked about it. Yeah, probably so. Let's see, number one is K1XXX. Number two is KA1X. Uh, number three is K1, and I can't read that. XX. K1XX. Or D is all of the choices above are correct. Well, the vanity call signs for a technician class operator, I think the answer is going to be... A. Well, let's just see. You're correct. Pull it up, man. I, f I forget about that part every yeah. time. Yeah. So that is a one by three, then, correct? Yep. Wow. And the reason for that is uh, the the shorter call signs are reserved for the higher class yeah. licensees. Who may select a desired call sign under the vanity call sign rules? A only licensed amateur operators with general or extra class licenses? Uh, B, only a licensed amateur with an extra class license. C, only an amateur licensee who has been licensed continuously for more than 10 years. Or D, any licensed amateur. Okay. You want me to answer that one? Go for it. I think it's D. I got that one. Let's so, go. so they'll take their money from any class license. There you go. You just got to get one or apply for one that's within your privileges. L like we said, yeah, a technician. One by three. One by three or two by three. Yeah. And on your application there, you can list more than one potential call sign. You list your first choice, your second, your third. Give them several there in case the first one you, they come across somebody already has. Yeah, and you can go online and, and check them, can't you? You can. But I guess there's a chance that between the time you check it and the time your application gets processed that it could have possibly been given out. Maybe yeah. not very likely, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah it is. Which type of call sign has a single letter in both its prefix and suffix? A, a vanity call. B, sequential. C, special event. D, in memoriam. What and do you I, think, Tommy? I, I know that one. All right. Uh, it's C. Let's see. It is C. Yeah. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. We're gonna, they're going to get tired of seeing the, yeah. the explosions. Yeah. I think we'll just have to 
stop yeah. them right here. <laughs> <laughs> it is a special event station. You know, you might be listening um, on the HF bands one day and hear a call sign like K1H mm-hmm. or, uh, yeah. or W1A or, or just if you hear three, then you know that's a special event and that call sign was issued just particularly for that special event within a certain time period. Yeah, and those those actually, I guess they expire and they, you have yeah. to apply for them again if you're going to have another special yeah. event. Uh, so, A, no, it's not a vanity call sign. We told you what that was. B, it's not sequential. You know, that doesn't even really make sense. That doesn't, but where, where they're coming from on that answer is call signs are e- issued sequentially. Mm-hmm. If you take your test, they're going to take the next one off that pool of, of call signs that haven't been issued. So they're, they're being issued sequentially. But that doesn't have anything to do with the vanity license right. or special event or three letters. Yeah, and, yeah. or in memoriam of... That doesn't uh, really apply. I don't even know why. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. Me so the, an- the answer is special event. Yeah. Well, let's go on to the next one here. And what is this one? How many persons are required to be members of a club for a club station license to be issued by the FCC? A, at least five. Uh, B, at least four. C, a trustee and two officers. Or D, at least two. Whose turn is it? Yours. I'm going to say at least four. And I'm going to say you're right. And I am right. Okay, and we won't do the... No, we're not going to do that. Yeah. We're going to spare you. Yep, so uh, there's not much we can say about that except it takes at least four. Yeah, and that one, that one, I actually kind of remember that one. Yeah, I did not remember it until I was typing in these questions right before the show. Oh, oh you don't get to answer them anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, All so right. it is four. And, I, and there's really, I don't know how you would reason that out that's just one of the ones you're just going to have to know that it's for yeah 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 no no particular reason other than the fcc said yeah you got to have four uncle sam said so yeah let's just look at the phonic alphabet here because i i feel like we're going to have a question about it in just a minute here and it's good to know alpha bravo charlie delta echo foxtrot golf hotel india juliet kilo lima mike november oscar papa quebec romeo sierra tango uniform victor whiskey x-ray yankee zulu what what are all those used for tommy for spelling out your call sign phonetically so it makes it really uh i want to say legible that's not really the right word but easy for anyone to understand um you know if you have mush mouth when you talk you know, yeah. so to so, speak, then, then anyone can understand those. So words. if I wanted to, someone to be sure they got my call sign right, I would say Whiskey 5 Juliet Delta X-Ray. Correct. Yeah. But I could also say Whiskey 5 Jack Daniels X-Ray, you and that would be okay too. Yeah. It is. It is okay. Those are the suggested ones. Those are the suggested ones. But yeah. but as long as it's clear, you enunciate clearly, and, and people can understand it, I think any of it's acceptable. Yeah, I think so. Next question: Who may select a vanity call sign for a club station? And it's a an extra class member of the club. B any member of the club. C an officer of the club. D only the person named as trustee on the club station license grant. So who do you think? Well, any any extra? I don't think you would have to be just an extra. Any yeah. member of the club? That seems possible. Any officer of the club? So I guess that seems more possible. Any person named as the trustee. Now that one that one kind of intrigues me um, because that's the one that's that's kind of mm-hmm. entrusted and taking care of it. That, that's one that's going to be the answer because you already pushed the button. I know <laughs> that I'm right. You are right. <laughs> and I did push the button too quick. Yeah, so I, I didn't miss it. Yeah, I mean, if any member of the club could request it, then if somebody got mad, <laughs> they could change it to something that's, awful. That's true. You know, so, yeah, the trustee of the club is the one who selects yeah, So that. show me which button you push to get the answer to come up first. So the next oh, time, if I don't I know one, I'll hit that. 
I will show you which button I push for the next <laughs> question, and it is. When using tactical identifiers such as race headquarters during a community service net operation, how often must your station transmit the station's FCC assigned call sign? A. Never. The tactical call is sufficient. B. Once during every hour. C. At the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during a communication. And D. At the end of every transmission. Now this kind of covers some territory we talked about last episode. It, it, it does. It's very similar to one of the other questions. But maybe we give them the answer first and or discuss that and then we'll tell them what we were talking about last month. Okay. So I'm going to say, is it my turn? It is. All right. A, never. The tactical call sign is sufficient. No. Tactical call sign. Now, that's not sufficient. Uh, B, once every hour. No. no. That's quite a long time. That, that's a long time. They're not going to make an exception just because you're at race headquarters. Uh, C, at the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during a communication. That's going to be your answer right there. That's going to be your answer. Because... That's typically when any amateur would need to. Right, and why, why would you vary the rules yep. because it's so special? And D, at the end of every transmission. Now, that's mm -hmm. not right either. First, let's just look at the answer here, because I, I know I'm right, Tommy. It's yeah, C. you're right. It, this is when any amateur would identify. There's no special um, changes there because of a tactical call right. sign. And, and last, last month, we went over when when you should, any operator should uh, ID and it yep. was the same answer. So yep. it has to be the right answer. At the end of the communication, and I think this just verified what we were talking about. You know, we kind of questioned what is a communication and what is a transmission? Yeah. And I think we just, uh, this question more or less spells it out. A communication is your whole conversation made up of a group of transmissions. Right, exactly. So, so after every transmission, that's kind of excessive. Although some people some people do, do that. that, yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just you don't have to do it that often. Particularly the guys talking AM, a lot of them will identify at the beginning and end of every transmission because yeah, because it might be ten are, minutes. Exactly, yeah. that's where I was going to go. <laughs> you know, they latch that <laughs> mic down and 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 go on, but it, it's a little different on AM, but uh, fun nonetheless. All right, next question. What type of identification is being used when identifying a station on the air as race headquarters? A, a tactical call sign. B, an official call sign reserved for races drills. Uh, C, SSID. Or D, broadcast station. Now, I think you can rule out a few just right off the bat there. Yeah, it's, it's got to be A because the last question actually pretty much gave the answer. Yeah. So a broadcast station. I mean, we're 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 not broadcasters. No. Well, some some are broadcasters, well, but that's not yeah, what we're doing here. Yeah, that's not what we're doing here. It's not an SSID. I mean, that's what your Wi-Fi router transmits. Yeah. Uh, B an official call sign reserved for racist drills. No, there's no such thing. No. Yeah. I mean, it's the tactical call sign. And a tactical call sign, let's just be clear about that. It's, it's my understanding that that's really just something you choose for yourself or your group chooses. It's not something the FCC requires. If, if there's a bicycle race going on out here and I'm sitting at the race headquarters and you're out there a spotter in the field somewhere, all I really am required to do by the FCC is just give my call sign when I ID. I don't, I'm not required by the FCC to say race headquarters. Mm -hmm. That's just being done because it's it's convenient and it kind of helps tie the group together. Yeah, to identify yeah. your role, yeah. so to speak. So maybe we ought to show the right answer. A tactical ding, ding. call sign. Got it. Yeah, you got it. Well, let's see if we got another one here. Which of the following is an acceptable language to be used for station identification when operating in a phone subband? A, any language recognized by the United Nations. B, any language recognized by the ITU. C, the English language. Or D, English, French, or Spanish, because all of those languages might be spoken in the U.S. That's true. So whose turn is this one? 
to answer? Uh, mine. All right. And I'm a little bit fuzzy on this one, so I'm going to have to kind of reason through this one to be sure. Okay. Because Sounds good. So, any language recognized by the United Nations? Maybe. Any language recognized by the ITU? Isn't that... International like, Telecommunications Union. Yeah, but isn't that kind of like part of the United Nations? Or am uh, I mistaken about that? I'm not sure if they're related or okay. not. Yeah. The English language, I wouldn't think English, French, or Spanish. I'm, I'm going to say I, ITU, that's, I believe that's going to be B. Well, let's just see. The English language. Well, there's one I miss. Yep, we finally got to use that buzzer this evening. Yeah, no fist bump. Yep. Uh, so let's reason this one out correctly. Any language recognized by the United Nations? No? That could be anywhere. That could be any language, just mm -hmm. about. The ITU? No, your license is coming from the FCC. Uh, the English language? Well, that is the primary language in the U.S. English, French, or Spanish? Well, you know, if you're doing a QSO or a conversation on amateur radio in the United States, you, you may be talking to somebody overseas. You, you may speak 10 different languages. You mm -hmm. can use any language you want to yeah. on amateur radio as long as you use English when you identify, identify. your station. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Can I change my answer? No, it's too late. I saw you looking at that book back there, too. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. Which of the following formats of a self-assigned indicator is acceptable when identifying using a phone transmission? And it's A, KL7CC, stroke W3. B, KL7CC, slant W3. C, KL7CC, slash W3. Or D, all of the choices are correct. This says... Let's ask that question again. Which of the following formats of a self-assigned indicator are acceptable when identifying using a phone transmission? Self-assigned. Yep. So what are you, who's, whose turn is my turn, isn't it? It's your turn, but I think I know the answer to this one. Well, go ahead. I won't take your glory. I'm going to say it's D. That's what I think, too. Well, let's see. And it is D, because it's self-assigned. You gave your call sign KL7CC. Whatever you say after that, it's your own business. Yeah, you don't have to. It's, yeah. kind of, it's courtesy to, to, yeah. to say that you're from another area. Yeah, so what they're saying there when they say W3, that means, you know, I've, my call sign begins with KL7, which means, you know, I'm in some other area, but right now I'm in the three area while I'm talking. Yeah, you're from another area. From another you're, area. You're operating in the three zone. But I don't, generally, when I've heard this on the air, I don't hear them say uh, stroke W3. I just hear them say stroke three. Yeah, the same here. But it, it's self -assigned. And I guess that's correct, too. Yeah, so. that's the, yeah there's no, no really wrong way to do that. Next question. Which indicator is required by the FCC to be transmitted after a station call sign? Stroke M when operating mobile. That's number A yeah. or letter A. Letter A. B, slash R when operating a repeater. C, stroke followed by the FCC region number when operating out of the region in which the license was issued. That sounds like what we were just talking about. It does. Uh, D, slash KT, slash AE, or slash AG when using new license privileges earned by a CSCE while waiting for an upgrade to a previously issued license to appear in the FCC license database. Okay. And this is your turn. This is my turn. And I'm going to say it is. Let's reason them out. Reason them for us. Okay. A, stroke M when operating mobile. That doesn't, no, nobody does that. I've, listened and I've never heard anybody do that. 
Have no, you? but I hear people say like W five JDX Mobile. Yeah, I do. But you I've know, never... we and that's that's a regional thing though. Did you realize that? I know some some areas they call it mobile, mobile, yeah. mobile. To it's I don't know if it's divided to Mason Dixon line or where, <laughs> but uh, people down south will we'll say mobile and yeah. mobile. You know, means you're a little further north. Yeah. But, but you're not in Mobile. You're not in Mobile. So you're saying stroke M or slash M is uh, is not required anyway. Yeah, it's not required. And stroke R when operating a repeater, that's I don't think that's required either. I've never heard anyone do that. No, but you will um, you will see some uh, digital call signs or maybe some CW call signs for repeaters that might have the slash R at the end of it. Mm -hmm. That's okay, but it's not required. Yeah. And uh, just the stroke followed by the FCC number when operating out of the region in which the license was issued, which we just covered that on the last mm -hmm. question, so that we determined that wasn't required. It wasn't required. You it's can courtesy, do it. but it's yeah. not required. Yeah. So that pretty much leaves D, Delta. Stroke KT, stroke AE, or stroke AG when using a new license privilege earned by a CSCE while waiting for an upgrade to a previously issued license to appear in the FCC database. All right. Well, let's see if you're correct. And, and being a VE, I already knew that one was right anyway. But There you go. I, I didn't remember the KT. By the way, the answer was D. Uh, I knew AE and AG because I actually have used those when I passed my test and was waiting for you know, my new uh, license class to be posted. Yeah, the the KT, you start out with the technician and you've got to have a, a call sign. So, so I'm guessing... I think that's if you happen to have been a novice and you upgraded... Which, yeah, there haven't been any novices tests done in... in no, but maybe you had a novice license and you just kept renewing it every yep. 10 years and yep. you upgraded. So I guess that would come into play for that. So that's probably why I've never heard that. That would be a really rare occasion that would happen. Right. <clears throat> but, but yeah, we talked about this last week, too, though. If you've already got a license and you go take a test and to upgrade that license and you pass it, you can start using those new privileges immediately as long as you use the proper identifier, like slash AE for extra or and slash AE. And you've got general. your CSCE. And you've got your, your CSCE. Your certificate. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to wait for it to actually appear in the database. You can start using it right away. If you're a new amateur, you know, if you just passed your technician license, you got to wait for it to show up in the database because you don't have a call sign yet. So that's all the questions today. You know, we've, we've talked about uh, call signs specifically this time around. Yeah. And, it, you know, we talked about vanity call signs, uh, call areas, phonetic alphabet, you know, a bunch of different related topics there. Oh, so it's all good stuff. It's all stuff you need to know. I'm, lo I'm looking forward to getting into a little bit more of the technical stuff mm -hmm. too, which uh, that, that'll We're be coming do. soon enough. We're going to be doing. Well, you know, in your studies, we want you to follow along Ham College and, and go over these questions with us and some of the examples and stuff we do, but you're probably going to want to do some other study as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you wait for us to go through the entire question pool for the technician license, you're going to be a long time before you actually get yeah. your ticket. And, and we want you to get it faster than yeah. that. So we encourage you to, to do some outside study as well. One great resource is Gordon West. Uh, he has an excellent set of books there, but perhaps the the very best one, particularly if you don't have a license at all yet, <laughs> is the technician class license book here. It's um, It's got everything you need to know in it. It's very well laid out. Uh, a lot of good optional information that, that really is not anywhere else, but it's just Gordo's take on things, you know, based on how it really is. Right. And what we were talking about Elmer's earlier, and I can't help but when I think about Elmer, I actually think about yeah. Gordo. He's like Lee, Lee Elmer. Yeah, Lee Elmer, yep. You can find his books at W5YI.org uh, and, and a lot of other things there. You know, W5YI is one of the VEs. 
Yeah, absolutely. Or VECs. We, that's the one yeah. we actually don't have the cert for yet. Yeah, but, we uh, don't, but we're, we're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Coming soon. Coming soon. Well, you know, I think that pretty much um, is all we had prepared tonight. What do you say we go to the chat room for a little bit? There you go. We're in the chat room now. Yeah, we can take any questions on the from the chat room. Let's see what's going on in there. I haven't really looked at it much. Mike says no fist bump from me. Apparently, ah, he said repeater IDs do. He that was a slash R. I, I don't know in Canada, but not here, Mike. So no, no fist bump for you, my friend. KC five KWZ asks, is the test the same in Canada? And let's see. <laughs> Did Mike answer him? The regulations are slightly different up here, but mostly the same. So he's saying they do say stroke R? That's what he said, but then he said no fist bump for me, so I guess he changed his mind. <clears throat> uh, uh, let's see. I saw another one here I wanted to read. Oh, uh, John w one G and l says, The Canadian test includes proper operation of a radio inside an igloo. And then he said, I'm just teasing. I actually love Canada. <laughs> yeah. But Mike, um, I wonder if he does have an igloo. Maybe for his dog? <laughs> I'm not sure what Dave's talking about here. Stop passing knots. N-O-T-S. I don't know. Have to have to expound on that one, Dave. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, speaking of Dave, coming up... Uh, Monday night, we've got the... That's Echo the 23rd, February 23rd. Yeah, right? we've got the Echo Link Net for Amateur Logic. Uh, star do drop in star, node number 355-800, yeah. using Echo Link. Yeah, I hope to see you guys there, or talk to you guys there, actually. You know, they, those guys have a website, too. Do drop, do drop in, in, dot in dot org. Uh, KC5, KWZ, you know when you were showing the Crystal Radio... You should have mentioned that the cap symbol is different for a variety of caps. Yes, there are several different uh, symbols for capacitor on a schematic diagram. Some of them are two straight lines. Some of them are one straight line and a curved one under it. The one we had there was sort of like that, and it had an arrow drawn through it. That meant that it's for variable. variable. Mm -hmm. And there's others, too, but I can't. And, then, and that's actually going to be on some of the question pool coming up. Oh, it is. I have not looked that far in the question pool. You don't remember? It probably is. Man, what is that? Almost. Well, I think it's in the technician pool. Ago. It's in one of them. Yeah. Uh, Will Ham College go past the tech question pool to the other ones? Yes. Or strictly a show, for, or is it strictly a show for newcomers? Yeah, we'll we'll go past there at some point. Yeah. Right now, we're just concentrating on the technicians to try to kind of get everybody up to a common starting point, I guess you'd yeah. say. Yeah, you need to get some, some uh, new, younger people into the hobby so it'll still be around. Yep. But, yeah, well, we should go into the others at some point. Yeah. Tim, WA8LHB, says, George and Tommy, is there one source that lists all of the suggested frequencies and gentlemen's agreement mm -hmm. for certain activities like QRP frequencies, AM frequency, digital modes and etc. You know, I don't know of one. There's a band planned on the ARRL site that has some things it's on it. It's got some of it. It doesn't have everything. They don't have AM frequencies. <coughs> the oh, the AM one is listed on there. For some reason, the ARRL does not list that. And hmm. I, Personally, I believe they should, but they, they do offer a lot, of, a lot of that information. I can tell you, though, if uh, if you guys in the chat room will excuse me for a moment, I just happen to have an email here from a guy who knows a little bit about that subject, and Mr. Bob Howell, <coughs> K9EID, sent an email out a while back, and he was talking about um, where you can operate AM, where the um, gentleman's agreement for AM windows are, and it's 3870 to 3890 on 75 meters. It's 7290 to 7300 on 40 meters. Uh, then we go to 14.2 to 
265 to 14.270, 21.325 to 21.330, and 29 megahertz to 29.1 megahertz. Cool. And those are, are uh, AM frequencies. That Bob like to hang out on AM. Bob likes to hang out on AM. I, you know, I actually worked some AM this past week. I got on one night. There, there had been some guys on there talking, and, um, you, you know, I, I listen more than I talk, and I've said that before. Mm -hmm. But uh, these guys cleared, and another guy came on, and he wasn't real strong here, but I could hear him, and he was, kept throwing his call out looking for somebody to talk with. And I said, you know, I'm not going to go to bed for a little while yet. I'm going to just get in a conversation. So I you know, threw my call sign back at him. And we had a nice little AM chat there for a while. I can't remember his call sign right now, but he was uh, in Arkansas, not too far from Memphis. We oh, had, yeah? had a nice conversation. How much power were you running? I was running um, maybe 35 or 40 watts, and he was doing similar. Oh, that's all? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But, you know, because most of your um, HF rigs, you may have a 100-watt rig, but that's 100 watts PEP on sideband. It won't mm. do that much on AM. Right. Mike uh, says, my crystal radio kit used a wiper at the base of the coil to tune. And you know, Mike, one of mine did too. It was it was just like that. As a matter of fact, that might have been the one that I took the Quaker Oats cardboard tube mm -hmm. and, and wrapped with wire and skinned the insulation off and had a wiper. Yeah, because it's a tuned circuit. In that case, you probably had a fixed capacitor in there. And you were just in the inductor instead of the capacitor. Quaker Oats cans, man, those were the Altoid day cans of the 70s and 60s, 70s. Yeah. The yeah. people made, uh, I made pinhole cameras out of those things. Oh, really? We did all kind of stuff with those things. Huh. And the cardboard cans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They were made out of cardboard. Yeah, not but they metal. were the Altoid can. You know, uh, we do everything in Altoid cans nowadays. Everything went in a Quaker Oats can. Yeah, let's see. And uh, wrap the wire around toilet paper rolls. Yeah, uh, John W1GNL says the ICOM band plan thing is pretty good, too. And I've got one of those in here somewhere, but I don't know where it is right now. You think it's about time we wrap it up for today, Tommy? Yep, let's wrap it up before I have another coughing fit. <laughs> okay. Well, we appreciate it. Or, or laughing fit. Laughing. Either <laughs> one is subject to happen at any moment. Pretty much. Yep. Well, we appreciate everyone being here today. This is episode two of three. Three of two. Yes. Three, that doesn't three make of sense, two, But yeah. it is, isn't it? But it is true. <laughs> yeah. Because we didn't start... Uh, <laughs> we didn't start. See, I told you it could happen at any time. We didn't start counting until we got to number two. Correction. He said uh, Textual is the IRC client that displays ah, pictures in line. Okay. <clears throat> that sounds better. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, and we will see you next month for Ham College. Next month, uh, at the end of the month, we'll be back with another um, amateur logic in the middle. In a couple of, of weeks. A couple of weeks, yep, of the month. Oh, and uh, this will be out of context if you watch this show anytime later, but I'm going to be in Orange, Texas, February 28th at the Orange County Convention and Expo Center, the Orange Amateur Radio Club, and the Jefferson County Amateur Radio Club get together and have a uh, a ham fest every year. It's a really nice conference center down there. They got dealers, flea markets, tailgating, VE prizes, programs and forums, door prizes, and a lot more. And I'm going to be one of those programs and forums. Cool. And they have Boudin. Boudin. Well, that's Friday night. If you're there by 6:30 Friday night, they're going to have barbecue brisket links and smoked Boudin with all the trimmings. Sounds like you should go early. I am going to try to be there in time for that. Cool. Yes, I am. But I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there. That's going to be a fun event. Yeah. And don't forget to join us uh, Monday night, those of you that are in the chat room now, for yep. uh, for the Echo Link Net on the Star Dew Dropper in Star uh, Node 355-800. Yep. And we'll be posting that in the Amateur Logic uh, Facebook group and Twitter account and stuff as a reminder as well. All right. 
73. 73, everybody. based on the coherer receiver. Guglielmio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blooper number one. I had a little radio that had that cat horse growing up when I was a kid. How did you catch that Somewhere. cat? They were pretty quick. Well, <laughs> that's how that looks right. But we'll just leave <laughs> off his first name and then we can probably get through it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I can now. <laughs> all you got to do is one whisker. That's all you Just need. one whisker is all you whisker. need. Huh? Can you reuse it? <laughs> but hold it his head still. <laughs>